first of all, I want to appreciate everybody for coming out, taking their time out on a Saturday um, to put this production together. What this production is about is about reentry, restorative justice, and the barriers of getting employment once you return to society. We have a dynamic cast, um, a dynamic team of people from Washington, people from Suffolk County, people from Brooklyn, people from Manhattan, and every place else. Um, we want this to flow in the proper direction. We want this to be something powerful that people can utilize um, when they come home from prison. Sometimes you come home and you feel there's no hope. So this panel, these people, my family, we're here to give that hope to people coming home from incarceration and re-entering in society. We have a dynamic host. His name is DeMar Tyson. He runs a magazine called Urban Life News, uh, which is publicated throughout the state jails and the federal jails all around the United States. We have different individuals, Philip White from Exodus House, but today he's representing himself and the struggles he went through and trying to give guidance to others that's coming home. Taisha from Incredible, Credible Messengers from Brooklyn. Shaniqua, she just got a new job, but she's also a part of Rise Up Inc. Now Rise Up Inc. is partnered with Karate Joe Juan Rogers, who's in the penitentiary right now, but a dynamic individual. And if all goes well, he should be home in June. We have Horace Graydon. Horace Graydon works in Hempstead, New York, um, for the past six or seven years, giving information out, giving hope out, and using his story to uplift people. The dynamic thing about Horace is that he's originally from Washington, D.C., so he's connected us up to our Washington family. And hopefully, um, our next part two, we can include some of those after the virus is over, we can have a bigger um, demonstration. We also have our sister, who is the glue um, to a bunch of people and a bunch of different organizations coming together, and that's Antonio mm -hmm. Coldling. Yeah. But she's put together a dynamic team and she keeps us together. I'm talking about both Sakus, powerful, man up, um, different people, credible, credible messages who's going to already shouted them out, but they needed two shout outs, so I'll give it to them. <laughs> um, powerful, man up, um, and people inside, Ron Rogers, money and people like that. She keeps us all connected. If anybody doesn't know who Saku is, you will by the end of this. I'm going to pass it to, to Tyson and let him do his thing. Peace. Peace, peace, peace. Thank you, Marcellus. I appreciate uh, you guys having me here today. My name is uh, Damar Jolly Tyson, publisher for Urban Life News Magazine. Urban Life News Magazine is a hip-hop street culture themed publication. Uh, we use hip-hop to entertain our people. We all uh, use street culture to reconnect to the places that we come from, but the foundation of Urban Life News Magazine is re-entry re and reform and restorative justice. And the whole idea and concept of our publication is to provide a space that's similar uh, to the tradition of a community center. And we have each one of the components are uh, being represented by these people here today that speaks directly to those people in the communities and in these institutions who are looking to have resources and connections back to the community. So today we're going to start with getting to know our panel. You already heard from Marcellus, uh, the CEO for Reigns for Life. Uh, we want to thank him for having us all here. Uh, he's been putting on for many years. I first met him uh, many years ago by a mentor named Gary Pryboy. He introduced me to Marcellus, and Marcellus got me my first speaking engagement at Freeport High School, uh, giving back to the community. I never wanted to speak to the children because during my time, I felt like the children were too difficult for me to reach. I needed to speak with the parents or people who can understand the language that's being spoken in terms of reentry. But I'm glad he did it because if I hadn't met him then, I wouldn't be here today. So let us get started. First, we're going to get to know our brother to the left, Mr. Horace Graydon, another comrade of mine. Horace, you want to talk to the people and introduce yourself and let us know what, about some of the services that you're providing in the uh, Hempstead and beyond areas? Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Marcellus uh, for inviting me today. I've been, uh, uh, been affiliated with Marcellus since I've been, in, since I've been home. 
In fact, Marcellus was, uh, you could say Marcellus was, uh, I was a mentor of Marcellus. <laughs> I'd say it like that because a lot of things that I learned concerning the street came from Marcellus and Mr. Tyson. Uh, now, Mr. Tyson has, you know, he hasn't mentioned a lot. He likes to mention about a few of the things that he's done, but he's been one of the guys that I've trained under. A uh, very articulate brother that, and I watched him move his magazine from, from down to nothing to where it is now. I watched the rise of the organizations of Rain for Life under Muscle Marcellus and some of the hardships he's had. And I've worked with him. So those are the things, those are the type of men that I sat and learned under. Uh, uh, I'm 76 years old, though I still look good. You know, I want that fully understood, you know. Uh, but what I want to say is uh, 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 you, you're never too old to learn how to do things new again. And so I'm trying to give back as much to the community as I possibly can. Uh, I, I, I work between Washington and, 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 and New York. And also we, we have connections in the Chicago area where, uh, and, and we work through there. But we do a lot of our work right here in, in the village, in the town, Freeport. We, we try to reach a lot of our youth. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, that we do is our, our, our outreach, which we are going to start back soon, I hopefully. But uh, it is, I'm glad once again to be part of this uh, panel. Thank you, Mr. Gray, and I appreciate that. So let me just ask you a question. Uh, in your experiences with working with the youth of Hempstead, what is the most difficult thing that you have encountered in your experiences working with the children? Well, uh, I, I'm not going to uh, try to describe uh, the difficulties that you might have with a, uh, with a child. Uh, it, I, I try to use each child individual and try to treat him as, uh, not as my equal, but I try to treat him as a young son or grandfather. I try to treat him like that and give that type of information. But I wouldn't find a, a young, young, young man or young woman, I wouldn't find them difficulty. I found, I found grown-ups as difficult more than the youngsters. Wow, that's, that's interesting. You, you've, been, you've been around for a minute, right? Uh, uh, bless you, you haven't went into your story. You went into my story, but you didn't go into your story. You know what I'm saying? You spent about 30 years incarcerated and you still out there hitting the pavement, getting busy with these youths. How do you continue to find motivation, rain, hell, sleet or snow? Uh, sleet or snow? How, how do you keep going? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a person of, uh, uh, that, that leans on old familiar things and things that I've learned in the past. And some of the things that I learned in the past, I came up through the era of uh, the Black Panther era, I came up through the Marcus Garvey era, my father was a Garvey Knight. I, I, I learned a lot uh, through the 60s and the 70s. And uh, I think that uh, I, I lean on history. I try to uh, lean on my, the, my, my, my historical background, things I've learned in the past to guide me in the future, especially dealing with a lot of our youngsters. You know, I try to let them know that black history is not just one month, but black history is 365 days a year. Uh, and I, that's what I try to give toward you. I try to give everything I try to say, always try to put in this historical perspective. You know, even what we're doing here, some of the things that we're doing now, brothers are still doing that they, were do, that they started in the 60s. It's just a continuation of that. You know, and I'm proud to be part of that, you know. Uh, and I think that's what we have to, we have to learn to do uh, in, in this generation. We have to learn how to, how to work with each other. I know I'm not the hardest, easiest person to work with, but I've given and I've learned, you know, that if you want to make a change in our community, we have to learn how to work together. And we have to, the first thing we have to do is learn how to be humble to each other. And I think that's very important. That's great, man. I greatly appreciate that. You have one more thing going on. You have many things going on, but there's something uh, in particular that's really profound. Uh, I, I believe the name is called uh, Letters from the Cell. Letters from the Cell. Letters from the prison cell, that is. Can you touch on that for us, please? Uh, 
Letters, letters from the cell is uh, uh, something very difficult and very dear to my heart. Uh, I first, I think I first broke the letter to the cell to Marcellus about a couple of years ago, and uh, we, you know, and we barnstorm here and now together. But during the during the lockdown, I had a chance to to go over some old letters that I wrote to my sister when I was in prison. And I ran across a letter that I had wrote, to, wrote for my niece from 1977 when I was in Marion, Illinois, maximum security, uh, where there was uh, nothing but uh, where the Marion brother, the Marion brothers that stood up and said no more of what was going on, no more of none of the uh, discrimination that was against prisoners that took place in Marion. It was a very political place. Uh, and I came up with the idea is that there are letters that we wrote to each other that you may have wrote to a loved one, a, a, a letter you may have wrote to your, to, to your son. And they kept that letter because that letter touched them. So letters from the cell, it comes out of the heart, is that if you come home, and we have friends, I have a friend that just came home after doing 40 some years in, in prison. And his, his, his wife stayed with him for 47 years. And they passed letters between them and they kept these letters. And he would read one and she would read one. You know, profound stories. This is what Letters of the Cell is about. Stories that will, that will touch your heart. Uh, we, we, we have some... Uh, 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 Little, little anchors and podcasts we have little things that we we put out but letters from the cell is we, we, we look into uh, encompass uh, not only uh, guys that have been locked up but we want to hear from daughters we want to hear from mothers you know we want to hear how, uh, how profound it was you know I stayed locked up 33 years. I never thought my sister would keep a, a letter I wrote to her daughter in 1977. A profound letter, you know. I never thought that. I never thought I'd have a wife that, that held, on to, held on to some letters that I wrote. Some, were, some weren't as nice as I thought they should have been. But these are the things that's coming out of letters from the cell. Letters from the cell should be letters from the cell, also letters that, letters that turn the heart and turn your mind and let, let you know that returning citizens need the help, need your help in the transition back into the community. Thank you. Yes, thank you, man. I appreciate that, Mr. Harris. That was dope. Uh, next up, we have um, Ms. Shaniqua Rogers. She has a very, very unique story. And uh, she's a magnetic, uh, very humble person, but she's very, very powerful and she's doing tremendous things inside the community. She's using her time and the energy to reach back into the institutions and, and help make a way for those who are incarcerated and will eventually, hopefully become returning citizens, help them become successful as they return back to society and become positive and productive members of our society. Uh, I once read a book and I, I forget the name of the book, but I remember the lesson. And inside the book, it spoke about uh, defective and effective products. And so her knowledge is helping those men and women turn their situations around. They're becoming effective products instead of defective products. You know, a product that has something wrong with it. It doesn't allow the product to operate in its natural function, thereby limiting its, its power and its influence on the people. But an effective product, wow. That's something totally different. That's someone who's ready to make a positive contribution back to society. So let us take a moment to get to know Ms. Shanika Rogers and uh, let her tell you her story. Thank you, Tyson. Um, I'm Shanika Rogers. I am a single mom due to incarceration. I'm a niece due that is missing her uncle due to incarceration. I have many friends and family members who are incarcerated. So basically, I, through COVID, I just kind of jumped in, thanks to Unc, <laughs> it, 
And um, I was worried about my loved ones in prison and just wondering if there was more that I, that I can do or, you know, we were having at that time so many social justice issues and, you know, out there protesting and just trying to bring awareness and, and figuring out what I can do to assist people in prison, my uncle, whoever I can help. <laughs> and so um, a lot of people were getting out and uncle's sending people to me and I'm helping them put emails together and, um, you know, social media because social media is so big. Um, you know, just get them acclimated and in, into the routines of 2020, <laughs> 2021. Yes. And um, I actually connected with an organization, the CCA in New York, and um, they put me through an advocacy course where I learned how to put basic, basically put a law into Congress and follow it through. And so that's basically what we've been doing, preparing different um, initiatives so that we can try to pass and get some people out and change parole. And um, recently, I, actually last week, I started orientation with the CCA. They hired me. Okay, congratulations. Yes, and, and I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm really excited because they help the youth and they help other um also older sorry, people for our listeners and observers who may not know the CCA is what I'm sorry the Center for Community Alternatives okay great yeah so they they pretty much offer um services to people who just come get home and children who are incarcerated and on their way home so yeah so it's really exciting because i was a product of group homes and you know, running away and being in the streets and selling drugs. And so now I get to help children who are going through the same thing and trying to change their lives and, you know, need somebody to help them get their documents. And, and we just follow them through, help them uh, build their self-esteem and their milestones as far as getting their license. And it's just amazing. So it has been like COVID has did me well. <laughs> and I keep saying it because just being able to help other people and knowing that, you know, they're coming home, they're not, they're not really ready. They weren't really prepared. And I'm getting to like be the first person they talk to and, and help them and guide them along. And it's, it's just great. So, yeah. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned your uncle a few times. Yes. Where's where your uncle at? Who, if, can you speak about this guy briefly? <laughs> sure. Um, his name is Juan Rogers. He has done 26 years in, in prison, prison, upstate. Mm -hmm. And he's going for parole in June. And we are whew, more than praying. We know he's coming home. He's coming home this time. This is, is going to be the third time that he's going up for parole. And... um. I think this this time is it's his time. He's coming home. Yep, he's coming home, and he's heavily into reintegrating and helping others. And um, I just he's gonna do big things. <laughs> he's got to play it. How rewarding has this work been for you? I mean, because you've given us an overview, but I don't believe it was an easy journey. Because today, part of what we're doing, I believe that you're giving out. Some, some methodology <laughs> so that people watching can know how to do or get an idea of what they want to do if they wanted to do the same type of work. What, where would they begin? Well, not so mm. don't answer that, but just talk to us about your transitions, please. Well, the first thing I would say is I had to change my circle. And so I started to reach out to people who were doing what I was interested in doing or just impacted the same way that I'm impacted. And um, I was going on these Zoom meetings, <laughs> one by one by one, back to back, and meeting people and just, you know, just tell my story a little bit and listening to other people's stories and understanding and connecting. And that's really the like biggest thing was to connect with other people who are dealing with the same thing and <clears throat> it really helped because being a single mom 
not knowing what's going to happen as far as COVID and, uh, you know, just, uh, it was it was a lot. It was a lot to, to think about, a lot to worry about. And it I, I found a new family and they're, and they're sitting in here. <laughs> and <clears throat> I think the biggest part is being able to make all your experiences like there's a reason why I went through those experiences. Yeah. It brought me here. It gave me a heart to like accept people and not judge people and want to help rather than, you know, judge and leave people to where they are. I want to help them. I want to bring them up, and it brings me up. So, right, so. so you utilize your experiences yeah. to help others realize their potential. Yeah. You crystallize your magnificent journey into a purpose and a mission. You put in work, we need soldiers. You say it so nicely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They open up the soldier. Or the soldier is the one who keeps the army moving. It's easy to sit back and give orders and direction when you're not on the front lines of what's happening, especially in our communities. Because we live in a world of social media. Everybody's an activist from their couch. And when it's time to get out there and put some real work in to save these kids' lives, and not only kids, our people, because that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about the 85% of the 1.2 million people who are incarcerated in the United States, they come from spe specific locations, specific communities. You know, the other day I was contemplating on, on my personal journey. And as I was thinking about what I would say, because Marcellus, uh, he hooked us up with a, a, a Zoom meeting for the the, the, yeah, the youth at uh, Hostra, I believe. It's, but So that whole process <coughs> brought a thought. I'm sorry. So that, <laughs> so that whole process had brought a, a thought to mind in telling my story because I was trying to speak about the conditions within the environment that could have an effect on a young child's mind in, the, in their developmental stages. And so while telling my story, I was trying to think about what made my story so unique from everybody else who lived in the hood. And my story isn't unique, but what came out of that thought process is I realized that one hood is the same as all hoods. And so, so from this place, we can relate to each other's experiences, right? My hood is not different than yours because when we're talking about the hood, we are not necessarily talking about the people. We're talking about the conditions within the environment that makes a hood what it is. And most of the, the, the number one component is lack of resources. When you lack resources, you, get ingen you become ingenious in looking for ways to provide you with the things that you need. And the outlet is often the streets and gangs for these children who have undeveloped minds. But next up, we have another mag magnificent uh, young lady coming from, from Brooklyn. You're coming from Brooklyn. What you doing in Long Island coming from Brooklyn? But I ain't even going to. I'm going to let her introduce herself to you. I'm going to let her tell you her name. I'm going to let her tell you her story. And I'm going to let her tell you. How you doing? My name is Taisha Jackson. I am originally from the Bronx, born and raised in the Bronx, 163rd year. But um, after my incarceration, I wound up in Brooklyn in a, um, in a shelter and Best Style, which really, um, I felt Best Style. Just living there, it was a different environment from the Bronx. It was a new star for me. So that was where my new life began. Um, once I came out the shelter, moved in Brownsville, a few years in there, my son started going through some gang violence situation in the neighborhood, and I, it was just like I had to start again, you know? And, um, and it was worth it because, you know, what I recognized is some of the things that DeMar was talking about as far as the brain development, um, with the kids, you know, realizing that when um, harm for one is harm for all in our community, you know, when one child is going through an issue, it's a problem for every child in our community, you know, um, same thing, if one parent is going through an issue in our community, it's a problem for all the parents in our community, and so um, just throughout my uh, journey fighting, I've been offered positions that I knew nothing about um, that exist, and so um, I became the parent coach in Brooklyn Family Court with an organization called Good Shepherd Services. Through that, I was, um, um, after my incarceration, I was also, um, I got into a story to practice. I was offered through my job to go into a school that offered services for formerly incarcerated individuals. They offered college credits and healing 
um, to these individuals. And it was remarkable, the healing component that they had. And I said, you know, I've been home about 17 years now. And this healing component, it, 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 this is crazy. I've never felt such a burden lifted off of me, um, even though I was doing such a magnificent job in my where I was at in my community. I thought I was popping at my job. I'm like, wow, I'm in a court with a felony. But I didn't know that I was carrying stuff around that have um, not, not, wasn't allowing me to be the best woman, parent, um, a person that I could be. So um, since I got that, I, I, I haven't let it go. And, and you know, um, I share it. I thought that going inside the prison was better. It was another avenue. It doesn't end here. We have to share this with people that's been that's going through this now. Their healers can have healers can be um, transformed in prison. You can create healers wherever you are. And that's why I got this shirt on right now. Um, make healing normal because that's the overarching goal of my organization and for my heart and soul. And because you know when you speak about the brain development, how are our kids learning and growing and 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 being put in places and explain stories. Or, or even given history, and their brain and not even developed until they 25 years old. So we have to reevaluate what we consider normal and what we consider uh, support in our communities. And so the fact that I decided to go inside the prison, it, it, that's just a very small grain of sand of the work that needs to be done. Because if we're healing women inside, then we need to be healing guards inside and, 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 and counselors inside and children that's going to visit their parents inside and communities of the incarcerated. Um, and, and from where I come from, that's the whole community. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because um, there's not a year that I was born and still to this day that a black man near, close, or around me has not been directly impacted by the justice system, foster care system, poverty, racism, um, and all the deficits that black and brown people face. So my journey of healing and uh, transformation is something that I believe um, is for everybody. So tell us, the name of your organization that you created is what? Incredible, Credible Messengers, Inc. Incredible Messengers, Inc. Yes, Incredible, Credible Messengers, Inc. And, and so how long ago was it when you created this organization? How so, long has it been around? So like I said, um, after I graduated the New School Institute for Transformative Mentoring, we started like about two, two three months after that. That was in 2017. We got our 501c3, and it was on from there since... Um, we started going inside the prison. We started doing the healing circles inside with the women. The superintendent loved us. You know, she requested that we come back even before we got our volunteer pass <laughs> because that's how much we represented when we went. Well, that's how much the ladies compelled to us at the resource fair, right? So that's, you know, real people do real things. And so it's just... If you know, if you know, you know, our youth-led program right now um, that would be trained and restored to practices will be able to heal youth in the community since COVID. Who's speaking to these youth about their, their health? Who's speaking to them about staying home, not being able to be their best self, performing arts, read, study, losing loved ones, right? In a way that's healing, right? Anybody can ask you a question, but it's coming for somebody that you know, that's teaching you a dance every day, that's in your community, that eats free lunch with you, then you respect it more, you love it more, you'll cry more, you'll pray more, you know, you'll interact more, you'll engage more. So we want these children to... The uncool parts, the real, the pain, the transformative parts, right? The the helping the next person part. That's, that's what you're talking about, right? I mean, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear the pain. Yeah. Just like you get a cut, you know? It takes a while. You understand what I'm saying? The first person or the most likely, the best person, if you have it, that person in your life, is your mother. You right? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, somebody kissed the wound for you. You know, make it better. Change your Band-Aid for you. Twist it up. Get a little infected. If it hurt a little bit more, check on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those closer to the problem is closer to the solution. You know, I have realized, you know, at first, when I started that program, I was hurt. 
I was hurt. I didn't even know I was hurt. And hurt people hurt people. But once I realized that I was causing harm to myself more than anything, I started to change it, right? Because no, if I'm causing harm to myself, then I'm causing harm to others around me. You know what I mean? I have to pay myself the same first, the, 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 the morale, the respect. Give myself the consideration and the time that I deserve in order for me to treat someone the way that I want them to be treated. Right? And so, um, like I said in the beginning, heal people, heal people. And that's the standards that I'm living by and I'm going by to ensure that, that we're not leaving anybody behind. You know, and the, like I said with the youth, with these performing arts, when it's led like this in their way, they're able to have a greater expression and we're able to create young activists in our communities to talk about the deficits, some of the deficits that I mentioned, like the poverty, the racism, gang violence, um, youth brain development, you know, whatever that knowledge and healing brings them, um, we want them to be able to expose that, you know, because that's my goal is to expose what, what, number one, God's given to me. You know, what he's allowed me to bring out and give back after all that I've been through. To allow me to smile and share my story even when it was painful. Um, to let someone else know how good it feels to be free in your mind, mentally, you know, emotionally, and physically. What it feels like to um, know that when you sit in front of somebody that it's a possibility that they will not feel the same hurt or pain that they felt when they walk next to you, near you, or whatever. I believe that I'm a person. When I walk in a room, everything that I touch, breathe, and walk on is blessed. And I haven't felt like that ever in my life. You said something, you said many things, but you said something that stuck out inside my mind about uh, when you get cut and it takes time for the pain to go away. And what you did when you spoke about that, you touched on one of my favorite books. My favorite book is As a Man Thinker by James Allen. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he said, he spoke, he gave a parable or an illustration. And he said, uh, when, you, when you put your hand in the dross fire, it, it, just because you take your hand out of the fire, it doesn't mean that the burning will go away. It takes time for the burning to go away, meaning that uh, just because you're making amends or you're sorry for what you have done, it doesn't mean that the, the transformation is going to come. You still got to put that work in. And so that's a profound uh, thing. And so to help the burning subside, they have a cream that they put on the burn. I'm pretty sure you guys know about that burn cream. If you get a burn, you put the cream on the burn. I, I forget the name of it. But you put the cream on the burn and then you wrap it in the gauze and that cream, it takes that burning sensation, that fire, because it don't stop because you take your hand out the fire. It takes that burn out. And that's what the healing does. That's what you do. You are the cream of the community. <laughs> and see, in the culture, in the nation, we call the cream the best part, right? Because it comes from information and experience. And so that's what I think about. What is the first uh, prison that you went into to do your thing? Oh, well, the first prison was Takana Correctional Facility, or all women's prison, upstate in Bedford Hills. Um, and all it was was a phone call, and just to let them know that we, we are interested. And we just caught it right at the right time because everything is at the right time. When you have a heart to do something, it's always the right time. Like, don't, don't, don't settle. You know, don't feel like what you feel in your heart is wrong. If it's the right, if it's there and you can pick up the phone or you can lend a hand or you can say a prayer, it is the right time. Um, but what's more important to me is the consideration of the other people's time that, that I was working with. You know, we have to consider other people's time around us because this, is, this work is not about us. You know what I'm saying? It's about everyone who we want to feel, everyone that, everyone. It's for everyone, everyone. Because we have, a, even as black and brown people, we have a way, we still live in this, we're still living in this, right? We're still going through some of the things that we're fighting for every single day we're going through it. but. Because of our traumas, some, some of us, it won't allow us to say, you know, I can walk inside this precinct and make a difference. 
I could work inside this ACS institution and make a difference. You know what I mean? Like, and we can because we're powerful together, you know? Because of things that's happening, it causes hostile environments around us. But it takes a will to heal. Mm. Just like it takes a will to say, I don't want to no more. I'm staying away from these people. I don't love my neighbor. It takes a will to say, I want love. I want peace. I want happiness. I want joy. I want connections, you know, in my community. So my thing is that I have a will to heal, right? And I want to transform that strength and power to other people because I need people to be able to do the same thing that I'm capable of doing. You every day. ministers. Every day. That's it. Great, great, great. So, so you, 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 you're using your work and your experience to create healing ministers, healing everywhere healing I go. Agents, right? Everywhere because I go. Because energy begets energy. Energy begets energy. That's the every, real. Everything is energy. Before it can become a material thing, right? I mean, first it's a thought, but in order to make the thought to be made manifest, you need some emotion to make that thought come alive. And everybody can't do it, right? I sat with a young man last night. He said, we argued. He was so smart. Oh, my God. And he would, we, and we were so passionate about what we were talking about, and we just started going, da -da -da -da. and he just like looked like he wanted to punch me in the face and so forth. And I was like, hold on. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, hold on. I said, hold on. I said, I'm not going to have this conversation with you. I'm going to bring it down. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because I was. Of course. I'm sorry. I apologize. I said, I apologize. I said, because when I walked in the door and I started talking to you, the moment you opened your mouth, I felt like I met a dynamic man. I was so intrigued to hear the next words that's coming out your mouth, right? Because the devil has a way of creeping in. Oh, you blew his mind. And I blew his mind. I always blow people's mind. <laughs> and so he was like, you know, he was looking at me like, and I was like, and the devil has a way of creeping in. I just wanted to tell you before we continue on our conversation, the shivers that you gave me, the chills that went through my body from the last sentence you said, even before the argument. And I wanted to be able to start that over and get that to you, you know, right. so that we can have that space, that respect, and moral support for each other. I just want to start off again by saying, how are you doing? How was your day? You know what I'm saying? And, it, and, and things come out beautiful. I seen a young man that I love dearly. He was drunk. And I tried to show him away. You can't throw people away. You know? But I'm, 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 I'm a vessel. I'm a healer. So when I do it, it's even worse, right? Like, what are you doing, Miss Jackson? And I'm going to get smacked in the face. Because I'm not supposed to be doing that. That's not how my heart is. I change. I don't hurt people. I stay, heal people. Stay true to your, to your he essence. Was, yeah. He was drunk, and I was like, come on, you got to go, B. You got to go. You got to get out of here, you know, because I'm still human. So I will do human things when I get triggered, right? And so he like, you, what you think? I just want to talk to you. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you, B. I told you to stop coming around me drunk or whatever, you know, or whatever. I told, yeah, I, I was on some, yeah, like, fuck the, forget the heal people, heal people stuff. I'm about to. Knock him out, right? So he like, I just want to give you something. Ty, you always doing stuff for me. And I was like, yo, I'm tired of you. You always want to give me something. And he pulled out this ring right here that I got on my hand. He pulled out this ring right here that I got on my hand. And he said, the ring, and y'all know I'm a praying warrior. The ring got the whole Lord's prayer on it. Wow. Our Father who art in heaven, wow. hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Listen, I, it just melted my heart, you know? But what I say that to say is, it's never what's going on. You understand what I'm saying? With our people. And this is why we love our neighbor. This is why we're supposed to love our neighbor the way that we love ourselves. We always have to look at each other in a way of what's happening. What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? What happened a second ago? What happened years ago? What happened the night before? What happened before you walked in this door? What happened? Did you trip when you walked in? We have to consider that each and every last person has something going on or something happened in their life before they entered ours. And that we have a will to be responsible enough to not only heal ourselves through that process, right, for caring, but to lend a hand to you know, heal someone else. So, if you don't have any more questions for me, <laughs> as a woman and a healer, I will definitely pass this to the left.
Okay, all right, so we're back. Thank you, we just took a little quick break. Uh, next up, we got my brother, Sia Law. Sia Law is gonna talk to us today about overcoming barriers to re-entry. And this is, this is important because there's so many pitfalls and, and things that the returning citizen may be unaware of that he or she has to face, and we need someone to walk us through, give us clarity on the things that we're gonna be facing. And so our brother C.L.R., Mr. Phillip, he's gonna walk us through that. So let us hear from the brother. How you doing today, sir? All right, peace, my brother. Peace. Okay, um, how y'all doing, family? Everybody here, I basically, I basically have shared a space with, and we basically did some of this work together at one point or another, right? Um, basically, I like to stand up and I like to move around because what I do is kind of interactive, right? Um, the good brother Tyson, he introduced the fact that I got a workshop called Overcoming Barriers to Reentry. The intent of this particular workshop is to address the areas that uh, are basically recognized as challenges for the average person that's coming home in today's time and to give them some real life, like on the ground intelligence on what they could do to try to overcome or to at least to be able to maintain enough to transit whatever that particular challenge may be. So what I want to do, I want to give you some examples of some challenges that I'm aware of, right? I'm just give an example of some challenges that I'm aware of that's taking place right now and give you some examples of some remedies in these situations or even a particular mindset that will help a person to be able to come up with their own solutions in this particular box, right? So let me tell you a little bit about myself before I get into the workshop, right? As I stated, though, as the brother uh, Tyson introduced me, my name is CLR. I had the power to name myself, so I'm the guard, if nobody's familiar with where that comes from. I'm the G-O-D. My, my given name is Philip White, right? Um, what puts me in a position to even be in this particular field or to even be speaking from a particular uh, base of knowledge on this topic is the fact that I myself have had experience with the criminal justice system. Um, at the age of 17, I went to prison with a 30 year life sentence. Well, I got arrested at the age of 17. At the age of 19, I was sentenced to 30 years of life um, for two murders that I deeply regret. And I'm not saying that because that's the uh, accepted and popular thing to do on camera or in front of people. The reason I'm saying that is because uh, the decisions that led to those particular results really impacted not only just me, but a whole bunch of other people. And I just want to touch on something just so you can understand how decisions that we make could impact people even in a, like extreme long term. For example, I mean, this is a little aside, but I want to put this up because all this stuff is a part of reentry, right? Um, last week on Wednesday, I went to a funeral. Not this week, the week before that. I went to a funeral for a good brother named Jules Stanley that was up north with me, right? The brother did like 25 years. We did a good portion of it together. We um, got into a situation one time when we was in a prison and we ended up getting to a confrontation, physical confrontation with the police and really getting into a whole bunch of stuff as a result of that. So me and him had a really strong bond. This particular individual, he was uh, best known as the brother eternal, right? But in any event, after the 25 years that he did when he was with me, he came home and he was home for a period of time and he ended up getting caught up in something else and went back and did six years. So just recently he had come back home again and in less than one year he ended up contracting COVID and he passed away, right? Real good brother. I'm talking about a solid individual. I grew up with his brother, but I didn't meet him until I went to prison, right? So I went to his funeral. Now it just so happened he grew up in my neighborhood, right? So I went to his funeral. Before I went to the funeral, I thought about it because anytime something happens in my neighborhood, which is where I live at now, the same neighborhood where I was responsible for taking these individuals' lives, uh, I went back, to, I went to this funeral over there and as soon as I came in the funeral home, I saw the brother of one of the individuals who I was responsible for um, just really unjustifiably, because it was unjustifiable. And I really don't want to go too much into that, but I just want to explain what I mean to you by unjustifiable. Unjustifiable means that it came from a mindset where I wasn't really operating at my best. Now, it, according to the principles that I lived according to at that particular time, in my mind, I did the right thing. Because I adopted some principles that it seemed like I was the only person that was adhering to them. And when I got in a dispute with these particular individuals, the only thing that I knew to do was to take the law into my own hands. Because that was a lifestyle that I adopted and that I lived according to wholeheartedly. 
That's why I say it was unjustifiable because given the same opportunity again today, I wouldn't make that same decision because I would never buy into that lifestyle. So I'd have never been in that mindset. I'd have never been in that position. I wouldn't have had the same values. So now that brings me to what I mentioned earlier of having regret. So my regret comes from mental and physical as well as emotional. Emotionally, I say, damn, man, I hurt people and I was a better thinker. If I would have applied my thinking as it is now in that situation, that could have never happened. It wouldn't have happened because I would have put the value of that individual's life above whatever my little petty grievances were that I had with them. So from that perspective, I deeply regret that. But there's a duality there, and the duality is that I felt threatened at the time, and I felt that I did the right thing, but in reality, I really didn't. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there, because I think I had to preface everything that I say after this with that. But in any event, I went to that funeral, and I was there with the brother's brother, his physical brother, and there was no way that you could mistake that this guy wasn't related to him, because he looked just like him and acted just like him. So the sad thing about it is that when I went there, I wasn't afraid at all because I didn't mean him any harm. And in fact, I mean, everybody basically know what happened. But when I thought about it, I said, damn, it was a little inconsiderate because I didn't think about the pain that I may have caused that individual by reopening wounds because maybe that was something that he didn't need to have to confront after 30 plus years, maybe 40 years. So it was inconsiderate of me to put him in a position to have to confront that again after so long. So that's something I've been struggling with for like the last two weeks because I really didn't want to be there, but I really wanted to pay my respects to this individual. So that was a dilemma. So those are some of the things that maybe we don't consider in re-entry that people could be struggling with, like coming back to the same communities and having, you know, drama in the community and different stuff. And this is, see, now this is stuff that I confront regularly. So I want to get to the, the real purpose for me being here. Before I do that, I want to say that I deeply regret that my, um, my purpose and my ability to be here today is premise upon somebody having lost their life. And I deeply regret that. But what I did try to do, I tried to salvage something of myself from that experience. And that's why I'm standing here with you today. All right? So now with this workshop, Overcoming Barriers to Reentry, I think it was a good backdrop to start with like pain that we cause other people. Because you never know what a person's coming, going through when they come to an agency for service or they come to an individual for service. And I like the way that you did that. The way that you turned that situation around, Taisha, when you said you were speaking to that young person and you took it off for you and you made it about them, that's a lesson that I need to repeat in my head regularly because I come more from the tough love type of school of thought. And when I approach people and I'm trying to, I'm trying to instigate or I'm trying to motivate or I'm trying Trying to uh, intuit or whatever change, then I come hard and I come direct. So it's a little different. And I could use a softer approach, and that's a technique that I would benefit from being able to utilize. So I would really appreciate if you could share some of that with me, right? But in any event, so now, uh, right now I work at an agency called Exodus Transitional Community, right? Exodus Transitional Community is a premier reentry agency in New York City. And they're expanding, just like the uh, sister uh, Shaniqua mentioned that she thrived during the um, pandemic. This particular agency also was able to strive during the, and I'm talking about thrive during the pandemic. And they have actually doubled their size during the pandemic. So when the pandemic began, it was like 50 something employees there. Now it's like 160. So they tripled, tripled their size during the pandemic. But the beautiful thing about it is that they tripled it by providing housing to people being released from prison. So now that's the angle on re-entry. I mean, the brother Marcellus, he got it too because he's doing the exact same thing. Don't act like you're surprised about anything. But my whole thing is this, he's doing the same thing. So now listen, the reason that I mentioned that is this. So the good brother Julio, the executive director at Exodus, obviously he got it. He sees that this is a major impediment to people coming home from prison, which is not having some way to live. Now, a few years ago, it wasn't as prevalent that people coming out of prison were homeless. Right now, it's basically expected. Because from my experience with people coming into my agency, about at least 80% of them are homeless. So now if I'm homeless and I'm coming to an agency for some type of help, am I going to be able to focus on the things that maybe should be the priority or am I going to be trying to get me somewhere to live? 
So does that pressure interfere with me being able to make good decisions that could possibly put me on solid foot and going forward for my future? Those are things to consider. So now we all know the answer to that because we're able to think clearly because we're not in that situation. But imagine somebody to come home from eight or nine years. They come home, they don't have anywhere to live, they didn't get their GED. So they come home uneducated, right? So imagine how afraid that individual may be. You come home uneducated, which is the biggest impediment that we hear people speak about. You gotta get an education. When you come out here, you gotta at least have a GED to get a job. That's true on one level and it's untrue on most levels. And what I mean by that, you really don't need an education to get a job right now. Not right now, right? But anyway, if people believe this, this is an impediment to them moving forward. So if you come in and you're feeling inferior about yourself, you don't have any way to live, you don't want me to look down on you because you used to walk around with $1,200 jeans. That's another major impediment to uh, re-entry and getting yourself together is the values that you bring forward. Because if you was getting 18, 19, 20 thousand dollars every two or three days, and then you come in here to this agency and you see me with a hundred and eighty dollar suit on, and I'm trying to tell you how to get the success, unless you have made some type of change or transition in your mind, it's gonna be hard for me to hold your attention. Particularly if you're facing some, facing some challenges, you're facing homelessness, you're facing um, lack of education, you're facing lack of support in your family and in your community, and you basically have no resources, right? So now, this, the workshop is designed, see, this is not the traditional workshop because all of the resources that are available at any reentry agency are available to me as an individual. So it's no reason for me to bring that before because I'm going to use that to help you. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to address your thinking and your level of confidence, how you see the world, how you interact with people. Because in my opinion, I can easily, I'm going to give you a good example. I'm an employment specialist right now. Somebody could come to me right now, they complete the job readiness workshop at my job. Within, let's say, two and a half weeks, I can have them working. That's not a magic trick. That could happen. What is the magic trick is to keep them working. So I could get that same individual job within two and a half weeks, and he'll be back in front of me within two and a half weeks because he lost that job. Why did he lose that job? The reason that he lost that job is because he hasn't been socialized into that environment. He don't know how to conduct himself in that environment. So if we running a week or two week job readiness workshop, that's not going to teach, that's not going to acclimate a person to how to conduct himself on a job, particularly with all these new angles that are being played, sexual harassment and this and that. A person needs to have some experience to be able to navigate these things on a job and to be successful. So if we bring them in for one week and we got 20,000 topics to try to share with them in that time, how likely is it that we're going to equip them for success unless they put some time into themselves? Now, if we're dealing with people who have traditionally been low performers, and that's not to categorize anybody or anything, it's just to give a point of reference so we could make a distinction. So if we're dealing with people who have traditionally been low performers in their life, then are they going to put that time in on the side to address these things? No, more than likely they're not. So what it helped them is a, a community type setting where they could come in and you could hear ideas bounced off the wall that are not directed at you personally or where maybe the strongest person in the group could answer a question that you wanted to answer to but that's going to equip you to overcome something in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying there? So this is like an interactive workshop that basically takes you because the only way that I can give the workshop is I got to poll my, my audience. So what's done in the beginning is that they come in and they do a survey. We find out what the most pressing issues are in their life, what they said as far as housing, spirituality, how they feel about themselves, their education, their relationship with their uh, friends and family, the relationship with their community, what their goals and aspirations are, what are, they doing, what are they doing towards their goals now. So that gives you an idea of the people that you're actually dealing with because this is not a one size fits all type situation. So let's say after they give those surveys, you analyze the surveys and you get an idea of what the prevalent issues are that may affect at least a good portion of the group because all of this stuff is really universal so then what you do is you create a community-based type conversation so the same way like if they came into an actually organized agency it's gonna be the same type of stuff resume writing uh, mock interview and we're gonna do all that but we're gonna actually do more of getting into the person because we want to equip people to be able to think through situations 
I don't want you to get to an interview and get in a situation where you don't understand what to do and you got to call me and ask me what to do. I want to equip you to be able to think through that situation. Even if you never encountered it, I want you to have enough information where you can say, okay, logically, okay, I can put these two together and I'm going to get a four. All right, I can do that. So as opposed to telling people what to do, think of, teach them how to think in the context of what they are doing. I'm gonna give you a good example, right? So here we are with the housing. So now a brother come in, he like, yeah, oh, uh, Mr. White, I need a job. I say, okay, my brother, I'm gonna get you a job. No, brother, I need a job right now. I say, okay, you need a job right now. You are aware that getting a job is a process, right? So what I mean by I could get you a job right now is that I could prepare a resume for you, submit your resume to an employer, and I could get a response where maybe the employer might want to give you an interview date. Now, what I'll do after that is I'll prep you for that interview. We'll send you to the interview, and we'll wait for the employer to make a decision. When the employer makes a decision, they may give you a stack of documents to fill out that you gotta return to them either by email or in person. After you return those documents, then you're gonna go through another process that could possibly include fingerprinting, urine tests, and a background check, possibly. You may not have to go through all of that, but all of these things have to happen before you actually get the job. So let's try to estimate how much time that may take. Let's say three weeks at the outside. Let's say that takes three weeks in an ideal situation. So that means that when you come in here and you say that you want a job right now, at the very least you got a month that you're going to have to wait to make that happen. That's not necessarily always a person's process because in some cases I can send you to an interview today and you start working tomorrow. But I don't want to prepare you for that process if that's the anomaly and a normal process is that you will have to go through all of this other stuff. So the thing is this, when people come into these agencies, nobody's explaining all of this to them. So what we're noticing right now increasingly is that when people come in, they're coming with aggression because they're in a process that they don't understand and they're getting the impression that people are ignoring them and not really trying to meet their needs. But it's not that. It's such an increasing demand for the service that it can't be personalized. Because it's a numbers game. Because you got to get numbers, otherwise you can't exist. So the normal personalized part where I can get a chance to get to know you and talk to you and figure out what's going on in your life, I could do that if I want to burn out. But considering the number of people that's coming through, we don't have time for that. So now people, some people need that type of support. Because that their why comes from the fact that maybe me, the service provider, believes in them. Because maybe there's nobody else in their life that believes in them. So then if I'm the brother that's bringing the service to them, they want to connect with me because they need that energy in order to go on. So that means that sometimes a traditional job readiness workshop is not going to work for everybody. Some people need more up close and personal service. They need to feel connected to somebody. They need to hear your story because your story is going to be ins inspiration for them. That's where this particular workshop comes in at. Because this is where the personalized aspect comes in. So as opposed to pushing people through like numbers and pieces of paper, we want to really get to know them and have an individualized plan for each individual with knowledge of what's going on in their life, not allowing them to use those things as any type of crutch, and then getting them past those particular situations either as a group or in a one-to-one -one type of setting. Because the solutions are already there, it's just that the individual can't see them because they may have too much emotional cloudiness going on for them to see it so we help them do it together so the thing is this and what I'm saying to you is this anytime that you allow people to have input into their outcome and other people's outcome you actually build leaders so the thing is this we could bring people into a setting like this that are really um, lacking confidence may think that they don't have tools to move forward or whatever they get in here and get inspired by giving information to other individuals and re recreate the individual that's standing right here you understand my point recreate them but what I'm trying to say is this the reason that this workshop has been successful for me is because the level of interaction empowers people it doesn't just push them through because I could easily get you to an employer and get you a job but what does it take for you to stay there if you talk to any reentry agency on the planet their greatest struggle was retention and retention is keeping people in the job so you need additional supports to keep a person in a job. 
Anybody that come out of prison right now, I bet I can get them a job. No matter what's going on with them. For the most part, give me some time, I can get them a job. But the main thing is this is that it can be predicted that you will win the bet at least 60 to 70% of the time. They're going to be right back at you. Because there's so many things socially and emotionally that are not being met. One thing that I really like that took place between Tyson and you is when we was talking about the healing. The healing aspect because, and I'm, I'm, I got to be 100% honest with you on this. Uh, my agency right now is a trauma-informed agency, which means this. Is that everybody in the agency is being trained to be conscious of and aware of at least having an, a, 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 an interest and what trauma or what type of um, what type of um, damaging experiences each individual may have had that we encounter, right? Do you know how taxing that is? You need time to do that. You can't do that if you're pushing people through on the assembly line. That doesn't work because there's no depth to the engagement. So then what happens is there's this superficial superficial uh, expectation placed on the staff to be conscious of a person's trauma when you can't do that because you can't turn trauma on and off. What mm -hmm. I mean by that is this. If you come and sit down with me and I'm interviewing you about employment and you start crying in front of me, talk about you remember when your father abused you when you was younger and that's the reason you can't get your life together, everything has to stop at that point. I can't go forward with employment because I gotta address this, this situation that you just presented to me and ensure that you could bring some closure to that. But the agencies don't give you time to do all of that. And ideally, when we set this up and do this ourselves, we wouldn't really be addressing that either because that's clinical. But the thing is this, at least you acknowledge it. We don't even have time to acknowledge it. Like in the situation that we're in with these big agency stuff is you can't do it. First of all, there's nobody clinical there to begin with. So when stuff like that happens, there's no way to send them. So my whole thing is this. is with, with, The thing is, we always speak about grassroots. That's what the origin of this is, grassroots. We figure out what we need and we provide it for ourselves. You understand my point? So what I envisioned when the good brother Marcellus came to me and he was saying, yo, listen, uh, we need a job development component. The component that I think is, is more like from a more like a nation of Islam type of perspective. Because what happened with Farrakhan, what he did back in uh, the 60s, what he did is he said, listen, if I could empower people and get them to have some type of belief in themselves, and believe in something other than themselves, and believe in some type of unified group, then those are people that you know, because you recreating a man, because those are the same exact things that were taken from the average person. Their sense of identity, their language, their connection to the group. So when you reintroduce that to the group, then you bring real soldiers out. So my thing is this, not from any religious perspective or anything like that, but repair people whole to some extent. Give them some of the things that they're lacking, and then you don't have to hold a hand through every experience because they feel empowered and capable of doing things for themselves. So now this is what we apply. And when I say we, I'm not saying agencies, I'm talking about me and people that we know. Anything that we do together, you should be able to do by yourself on some level. For example, with this, if you come in to get an application done, a job application done by me, I'm not going to do it for you while you sit on the other side of the computer. Now, I know some people are so intimidated, they don't even want to touch the keyboard. If I get a person like that, you got to at least stand behind me while I do it and allow me to explain to you what I'm doing. So the next time we get to an application, I'm not going to expect you to be able to do it, but I'm going to at least expect you to be able to explain to me what I am doing. And then maybe the third or fourth time, at least I can get you to type your name and your address or something. One of the biggest challenges that we face right now with people coming out is that they have no computer skills whatsoever and the world around them is computerized. And the thing is this, is that they've been so marginalized by computers that they don't even want to learn because they think that they're so far behind that they could just get, keep getting other people to do stuff for them. And that's the case with a lot of things. You understand my point? So, and, and what a lot of agencies do is that they enable these people like that where when they come in, they just pick up the torch and run with it for them. But what do you do for the individual in that exchange? So then the next time they encounter that situation, what are they going to be able to do? Absolutely nothing. Hence, this is where I come in. So as opposed to doing stuff for people, we do stuff together as a group. You understand my point? So we do applications together. We get up there, we figure out the boxes. What's your availability? Oh, I don't want to work weekends. No, brother, you got to work weekends. You the new man on the block. 
So anytime you get a job, you're going to have to work weekends nine times out of ten if you're just coming in. In addition to that, you're going to have to work the night shift. Did you know that? So if you go somewhere and tell them that you're not available for weekends, you're not going to get the job. How about that, my brother? So from now on, you put open availability on your application. You think you can accomplish that? So that's, that's an idea. See, so the thing is, they understand why they're doing certain things. So the next time they get to that box, you, do you think he's going to remember that? After I gave him all that, my brother? So it ain't going to be like he's sitting there stumbling or he got to call a job developer somewhere all the way across town and figure out what to put in the box. The people watching him on the camera, they know he's not doing the application himself. Because what people really don't realize these days is a lot of times when you go out for employment engagement, they put you in a room, maybe with three or four people, five or six people, give you the impression that they're not watching you, but they're watching you. Because there's no way that a person can learn you in five or ten minutes of an interview. And right now, with so much mental illness, which is another in, intense and serious barrier to reentry, because so many people are coming out with mental illness that's undiagnosed and untreated. Or if it is diagnosed, it's still untreated. You understand my point? So now here they're coming out and they want everything that everybody else wants. But in the process of them being interviewed by somebody like me or encountering me, I got to consider my relationship with this employer that I'm getting ready to send you to. Mm. So that puts me in a bad position because I can't allow one person to destroy an opportunity that maybe 12 other people could take advantage of. So I got to set this person on the shelf for a minute until I can find somewhere safe to put them. You understand? So as opposed to shelving them like you would do in a traditional agency, what we'll do is we'll empower them. We'll bring them into the group and let them get, because I don't know what you need, but you can tell me what you need given the opportunity to dialogue and interact. Maybe I can find out what it is. But in the traditional setting, when you coming through and all I'm doing is talking to you at the desk and filling out papers, I'm not going to be able to get it. I'm not going to be able to get it. I got to get you in a different setting. So now here, here's another thing, right? Um, so I spoke about the computers. I spoke about people who may have mental illness. Mental illness is serious. Homelessness is a complete and total distraction. So when you got people coming out of prison and they homeless, it's hard to get them to focus on anything other than trying to get a voucher, their 1020E, uh, yo, brother, I really don't want to work right now because if I'm working at the time I get a job, I'm going to have to pay a higher um, percentage of the rent. And I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. You cannot let all this stuff determine your success. You got to just move forward, brother, because you're going to sit. So you'd rather sit here for 16 months and wait for a voucher to come through and not take a job and sit. I mean, come on. Let's, let's really examine that, yes. No, I'm just thinking like some of the things that you're saying, you know, um, which is really good and true uh, for that matter. But like you said, when it concerns how long do you plan to stay on the job, no matter how long you've been there, if we change you for six months or 60 months, if you haven't addressed some of your traumas, getting on that job as a returning citizen, somebody can come home. If someone can just say something to you or will buy you um, if, if it's some trauma that has affected you, you have to deal with. Like you said, we don't get time to do those things on jobs. And people don't get to do time, black and brown people don't get to do time, stuff like that at home to address those things at home with their kids and with circumstances. And so how do we change that dynamic from um, how us as grass organizations like Exodus and Incredible Credible Messages not falling that line of giving up, of creating those kind of spaces for our people, mm -hmm. like like not rushing and, and kind of using restorative practices as a way of life rather than just to a certain amount of people that we want to use a way, like those who can't catch up. But the a restorative practice should be used for everyone from the time they walk in the door so that respectfully, when they do grant a position, um, in a firm or wherever they get a position at that, they won't be, they'll be less likely to be triggered from something that has transpired in their life prior to them getting training for employment. You know what I'm saying? This is what those trauma-informed practices and restorative practices is for, is to be able to let somebody understand that uh, don't cause no more harm on yourself. If you felt this way before, you don't have to feel this way now, but by way of understanding Right, I relate. Nine out of ten, if you in the community, the communities that we serve, we're serving people that have been through stuff. A black man that's been incarcerated is also the same black man that's been running from home to home to home to live with different women. So you got those skills already. You know how that looks already. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like nothing new under the sun, technically, 
is what I'm saying, you know. Uh, so what we've learned in like Institute for Traffic Native Mentoring is like them skills, even them building skills inside of prison are important. And again, like I mentioned earlier, validating just those small things. You know, it doesn't have to be that approach all the time. Sometimes people think you got to have a lifetime of training. People know your approach is has is in your mindset can turn different. It can be restorative. It doesn't take years to do that. It can be that one day you can validate somebody for not being late just because somebody you would probably not you, but in general, somebody would say to someone who walked in the door. Oh, thanks for coming late. You understand what I'm saying? But if that person came 20 minutes early, you won't say, thank you for coming in 20 minutes early. If you see them eating their snack, eating their lunch, we probably won't say that. You know, or just for even coming in. How about just validating that person, though, just for making it in today? You understand what I'm saying? Because it really changes the way people think about their lives, their job, their situation. And it doesn't always have to be a lecture. It can just be how... Like you said, how I changed that conversation and that single time, you know, just in that single moment because I want it different. Let me try to connect yeah. with what you're saying, right? Yeah. Because what I'm getting from that is this. I see that you bought into the idea of having a person in a group where they can air out maybe some of the challenges that they may, that they may be going through. But I think that another thing that's really important is the way that we could keep them in the group is to, they got to have some type of stipend. They got to be getting some type of money because you basically got them holding still for a minute after they came home in order to increase their chances of success. But the main thing that the individual's going to be thinking about is, well, I can't even buy a pack of cigarettes. You got me sitting here. I ain't, I ain't earned a dollar yet. So ideally, the, even while they're in that particular group, they need to be getting some money. Because that's the way you keep people's attention. Because if they can meet their basic needs, then you could get them to sit still. If they can't be, meet their basic needs, then all that therapeutic and all this growth and all the stuff you're talking about, it's going to be hard to hold their attention with that. So rather than just trying to show people off into jobs and positions and stuff like that, sit them still, pay them, get them, get them pay them to, to let you get to know them. Because once you get to know them, then you can figure out an approach for that particular individual. And what I'm saying is the money is there for that to happen. Like to give them a stipend to be in a group, to engage them, and then come with an individualized plan for that particular individual. But even when you come with that individualized plan, you're going to know they know the basics. They know how to fill out an application. They know how to get through an interview. They know how to conduct themselves on a job. Look, I've seen people go through job readiness workshops and you ask them after the fact, what is a no call, no show? They don't know. Do you know that during your first 90 days on probation, if you don't come to work, you out of there. Matter of fact, even after you on a job, if you don't call in and tell them you're not coming, that's a fireable offense at any stage of your employment. At any point, would you believe how many people didn't know that and don't know that? They don't know that. Well, I, so I end up having to tell them, listen, brother, do you know that the first 90 days, you cannot call out. You do not have any days off, none at all. So that means if your daughter gets sick, you got to let your brother stay there or your cousin or your niece or your nephew or you got to send her to school anyway, if it's possible. Excuse me, people understand that things happen. We understand that, but you can't have a bunch of things happening and you gotta try to prevent them from happening if you just started this job. Because a lot of people don't get that part. They get the job and 10 days later, they tell me, oh, yo, my car broke down. I called in and told them I was waiting for the guy to come and bang me. Oh, freeze, brother. You called and told them what? Let me call over there and see if you still got a job, bro. Because yeah. that don't even sound right. So <laughs> I call over there, they don't have a job. You don't have a job, brother. I told you from the beginning that you you can't call out there. And it's no flexibility, but people don't get that. So when you run them through real quick and you hit them with that, they're going to come right back at you and say, oh, man, I did hear you say that. But they're not going to really get it because they didn't get a chance to engage the information. So basically what I'm saying is this. I think that, to, to, don't get me wrong. I see these situations work, but we're coming out with people with some real special situations right now. And anybody that's working anywhere serving people can attest to what I'm saying. People are coming in increasingly demanding. They demand it because somewhere along the way somebody's telling them that they're entitled to something. That it's not like this is a service that I gotta engage to ensure my own success. I'm gonna go sit down and plop in a chair and they're gonna do everything that they're supposed to do for me because the state is paying them to do that. That doesn't work. And that attitude doesn't work. 
That attitude is going to get you nowhere but with some confrontation because people like to be appreciated. And see, that's another important thing. Here, I'm going to just draw a similar uh, 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 correlation between people wanting to be appreciated and a person going to a job interview. When I send people out to the job interview, I tell them sometimes that the most important person in that building is the person at the desk. A lot of people overlook that. When you go to an interview or you go to any business anywhere, the most resourceful individual in the building sometimes is the receptionist. But people go to the desk and think that they could disregard this individual because they look at them as the lowest person on the totem pole as opposed to the most important. A lot of times that's the most important person in the building. Mm -hmm. So you go there and get to any confrontation with them, you have no prayer of getting a job. So if we don't share this with the people in the group, or sometimes they don't get a chance to get this unless you get in a forum like this, there's so much information that the people miss that it turns out a lot of times just to be a quick fix. It's just a quick fix because you're not really equipped for success because you're lacking too much information unless you are a really driven individual. Without the, without the people who are really high performers, the, the failure rate here is like crazy. Because they coming back constantly. Like, yo, what happened, brother? Yo, man, I got on a train, man. I just decided I wasn't going in that day. So you just sit there and scratch your head. Brother, you've been on the job 14 days, man. Yeah, man, but I'm human. I'm human. Uh, brother, I know you're human, but you got to take the human part out of it when you the lowest man on the totem pole going to a job. That human thing dies in the middle of the street, bro. Because nobody's going to treat you like you're human. Because you look at for what you can produce. For what you can produce. And the quicker you get that, the better off you are. You understand my point? But either way, like, so my thing is, I could have I got up here and said some real traditional stuff and got up here and told you, oh, I know how to do this and I know how to do that. That ain't what it's about. It's about us bringing something different that's going to produce a better product. And I think what's going to produce that better product is the things that I introduce. Analyzing, first of all, cataloging the issues that people are coming with, analyzing them for that individual and coming with an individualized plan for that individual where they feel connected to a group of other people doing the same exact thing. You understand? And I didn't give you the dynamics of it, I gave you the overview. Thank you very much for your time, man. I appreciate it. So a, a wonderful expose on how and how we should reach back to the community and really, really help these uh, men and women return back to society in just a, a, a cross your T's, dot your I's kind of fashion. He spoke about some of the unforeseen things that every man and woman who's going to face, and we're going to we're going to really go back into that on our on our next presentation because we want you to go point by point. Of, of, of what they will experience in a real life situation when we're making a transformation. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna, want, we're gonna have the board, we're gonna have you walk us through it as if one of us had just got home. How does that sound to you? Sounds excellent, my brother. Okay, so next up, we have uh, the glue. You know, uh, the glue, you know what the glue is. The glue is what keeps something together. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like this this magnificent uh, member of the team don't even need an introduction. Matter of fact, we're just going to let her speak to you and tell us who she is for herself. Tell us what your name is and, and really restorative justice is what you do. Break it down for us, sis. Thank you, brother. So, uh, I'm going to be as, as brief as possible. <laughs> Uh, my name is Antonia, and I'm here with my family, um, my brother, Marcellus Mars from Rain for Life. Thank you for putting this dynamic team of people together. Um, I have sat in a circle with everyone here, and so um, that's why I say I'm here with family. Um, I... 
I have been around restorative justice for approximately um, maybe about six or a little over six years. And I believe that whenever I meet someone in circle, um, the experience is so much more profound and deep um, and really what it is is when somebody is able to let down their guard and to to share a story or a part of their life with you um, it allows you to see that person for who and what they really are um, and I believe I've had that experience with everyone here in this circle. Um, I met Tyson in a circle or a training about restorative justice and we were in a virtual space. But ever since I met him, I just loved him instantly. Um, and I think somebody, I, I believe Taisha said it already that restorative justice is not a thing. It's a way of life. And it's how we should treat each other, not just in the circle, but outside of the circle. Um, we all need love and you know we can't just love each other when we're sitting in a circle and being real and being open and being vulnerable. We also need to be loved when we're not at our best. So, um, that's what connects me to these people here in this room. Um, I will go anywhere with them, for them, because they are real. They are, um, they are creating a better community for all of us. So with that, I will pass the mic. What? She um she really didn't go into um, restorative justice practices and what it means to me and, and to the group. Um, res restorative justice is everything. Um, she said it's a way of life, which it is. But what she didn't say is she pushes us to really practice restorative justice. Not only while, uh, like she said, not only while we're in these circles, but also in our lives. Tyson called her the glue. And she is the glue. I mentioned when I first did the introduction that she put so many different people together. But the thing about it is the glue keeps us together. She stays on us to reach out to other individuals that's a part of this circle and a part of our family. She didn't mention that we went to Washington, D.C. as a team, met with Tyrone Parker and Corey Knight and developed a relationship with them through Horace Grading. She didn't mention Holla who she always loves and gets, and she wants us to give that energy to some people in Brooklyn who she put together. She also, let, let, do you hear all this? She also helps free political prisoners. Shout out to Baba Sekou. Um, he's the original, um, he's the, the glue, he's a motivation to me. Um, and, and I don't call him enough, and she always gets up on me for not calling him enough. Me and Horace been meaning to go out there and see him. He's in Harlem. Um, he's such, no, he lives in Brooklyn, but he visits, and he still goes to the same mosque that Malcolm X um, founded. So he's an incredible person inside of my life, a motivation that she doesn't know, but she, he, she put me in contact with him, and she keeps us together. Sekou, little Sekou. Powerful, A.T. Mitchell and Man Up, and G-Mac. In closing, I would like to thank everybody that came out. We touched on some prevalent, um, deep issues. Uh, we had restorative justice, credible messengers. CLA broke down the barriers to uh, um, re-entry. Just touched on it. Just touched on it, but he, he broke it down to a way that we can all understand it. And he did it um, a great job. Horace Graydon gave his input, and, and Letters from a Cell is going to be something that dynamic that's about to come out. Um, this is not, <clears throat> um, as Tyson already put in the air, this is not our first rendition. We'll definitely be doing another rendition to break this stuff down. Um, we want to reach to Washington. We want to reach Chicago. We want to reach Mississippi. We want to reach Virginia. We want to reach North Carolina. We want to reach Orlando. 
I would like to thank personally, we want to reach in the prison. and we want to reach inside the prisons. I would like to personally thank Families of Incarcerated People's Movement, CJI, Brooklyn Community Collaborators, and Brooklyn Bail Fund. The reason I say this because I'm an ex-offender, three-time loser, and these are the people that have faith, that have faith in me as far as giving me funding so I can do things of this nature, so I can help the community and do different things for guys that's coming home from incarceration. I would also like to thank my partners, Transitional One and Green Door Reentry for bringing reentry housing to Nassau. Um, again, we'll be touching bases real soon. Um, our next topic will be Credible Messengers restorative justice, and how we merge them together to help our community. It's Julio Medina, man. Nigga, we need funding, bro. Get at, get at CLR. If you want to be out here, if you want to be out here in Nassau, because I heard you was coming through Nassau trying to get out here, we here. This the team right here. You ain't got to hire nobody else. Let CLR, Philip White, run it, and we'll be his soldiers. I know you got the bag, bro. Peace.